11, week 11 of our um, story series. And don't worry, we're not having a quiz today. Some of you didn't do too well last week, but uh, we'll have another one, but not today. One of my favorite authors and uh, really Christian writers and theologians said this. <clears throat> he said that Christianity at any given time is strong or weak depending upon her concept of God. I insist upon this and have said it many times that the basic trouble with the church today is her unworthy concept of God. A.W. Tozer. Do you think really it's, it's that simple? Do you think that, that it's not really the culture that we can blame? It's not Hollywood. Do you, do you think really that it's, you know, it's not the, the influence on our children by bad people out there that, that really is the problem for the, uh, you know, the lack of faith or the advance of Christianity in our nation today? Do you think that maybe it could be none of those things but simply uh, our view of God? How do we view our God? Now, to illustrate what I'm talking about today, I brought a box with me, and uh, this box um, is what we would call a medium-sized box. Now, many of you have moved. Maybe you've moved houses or you've packed things up, and, and you know when you're moving, it's one of the most stressful things you'll ever do. I don't know if it's uh, stressful because of the actual physical exertion or because you realize how much junk you have in the closets and in the attic. <clears throat> But uh, nonetheless, you have to pack everything up. And, uh, and so you can get a great big box, but that box, you know, might be too hard to move once you fill it up. Or you could get a tiny box, but that box might be too small. You really can't get anything in it. You're going to make a lot of trips to the truck. So generally what we like is a box that we can get our arms around, one that we can wrap our head around, so to speak, one that we can carry. And here's what I think uh, what, about what Tozer said today. I believe that most Americans have put God in a medium-sized box. I think many Christian Americans have put God in a medium-sized box. Let me tell you what I mean. A lot of people grow up and they, uh, you know, they, they really uh, grow up with certain preconceptions and certain ideas about who God is and about what God does and how God works. Maybe you grew up in a church that, you know, it had as its mantra, uh, you know, hey, listen, uh, we don't do things like that because we've never done it like that before. And so that church is kind of a traditional church, and they're going to continue to do things the way they've always done them. And so for them, their God is in a box, you know. It's not really that we don't really want to let God out of this box, because if God gets out of this box, then, you know, then uh, he's not big enough to get out of that box, because he might upset our services, or things might happen, and I could end up losing my seat where I sit. And, uh, and so there are a lot of ways that you, you get uh, your notions about God. Maybe someone told you, hey, this is what God is like. And he only, he only does this, and he only does it on Sunday, and he only works with this kind of people. But I want to tell you that uh, God doesn't do boxes. Do you know what the biggest box in the world is? World record box was set not too long ago. It's 46 feet long. It's 20 feet deep and 9 feet high. Or thereabouts. That's a pretty big box, isn't it? I mean, that's a huge box. We might have trouble getting that box even on this stage. Nonetheless, <clears throat> that box even is not big enough for God. You believe that? It doesn't matter how big your box is. It doesn't matter, how, you know, if you said, no, Dave, we don't operate like that. Your box for God is too small. Because guess what? God doesn't do boxes. God's too big to fit in a box. And what I want to do today is talk to you uh, in this Bible story, the story, one of the most incredible stories uh, about how God doesn't fit in a box. You know, some people say, well, I'm too old, Abraham. I'm too old to start a family. I mean, if God was going to ask anybody to, to start a, a family that would become the father of many nations, it wouldn't be a 75-year-old guy, and he wouldn't wait for 25 more years to give him that son. Or you might say, no, I'm too broken. You know, look, I've done too much. I've been 
involved in this, and I've done that, and how could God possibly use a guy or a gal like me? Or no, I'm too insignificant. You know, I really don't matter. Who am I? I can't really do anything for God. I just kind of slip in the back on Sunday and sit in my little seat, and then I slip out. And don't ask me really to get involved because God really, I couldn't be used by him at all. But as we study the story, we study the story of the Bible, we find out that's just who God uses, isn't it? God doesn't do boxes. He gets out of the box. So today in week 11, we're going to meet this young kid. He's uh, about a freshman in high school. He's about 14 or 15 years old. If you're 14 or 15, now most of the 14 and 15s this hour are down in our gym at our church service for them. But if you're 14 and 15 and you don't mind, would you stand up real quickly? I won't embarrass you, I promise, because I know you're in middle school. And, uh, okay, 14, 15, anybody? Okay, thank you, Sophie. I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call you out. Okay, we got one back here. Okay, 14 or 15. All right, we got, so we got three young ladies. Okay, you guys can be seated. By the way, there's a great service over there you might, you might enjoy better. But listen, this is the age, this is the age David was when he first comes on the scene. You remember this story? It's one of my favorite stories. The story of David. And not because I share his name. Not because he wasn't very tall. Not because he was good looking. I mean, I could go down a list of things and tell you why I like David. None of those things. But because, really, David was a man after God's own heart. Let me back up a little bit. You might remember last week we talked about Israel getting to the point to where they wanted a king. Remember this story? The, the story of Sam, uh, Samuel and Saul. And Samuel went to God and said, hey, God, the people want a king. I'm not good enough for them, God. They're rejecting me. And God told Samuel, he said, listen, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They are rejecting me. And Samuel said, oh, okay, well, what are we going to do? And God said, if they want a king, we're going to give them a king. And they need to understand, though, when they get a king, life's going to be different. They're going to they're gonna suffer. He's going to take their men and make them soldiers. He's going he's gonna to turn them into servants. He's going to take their women, and they're going to be housekeepers for him. It's all going to change, and they're going to pay taxes. They're going to pay taxes because this king's going to have to live in a palace. He's going to have to eat the finest of food and ride in the best of chariots. He's going to have to have it all. So life is going to be different for these people. They need to understand that. That's what they want. Okay, that's what we're going to give them. And they got this guy named Saul. And to be fair to Saul, you remember, he was good. He had a lot of good things going for them. At first, he seemed humble. You know, they found him hiding in the baggage, but when he got back and he was standing head and shoulders above everybody else, they said, man, that's our king. He's a good-looking, tall guy. You know, there, ladies, beware of good-looking, tall guys. And uh, you just watch out because, you know, he don't, you don't know. And so he had these victories, and they were all going well, but all these victories went to his head, and guess what happens when you start storing victories in your head? You get the, the big head. And remember Saul was waiting on Samuel to offer the sacrifice, and Samuel didn't show when he wanted him to. And Samuel, uh, Saul said, well, you know, we'll go ahead and offer the sacrifice. And when Saul gets there, he goes, I smell, what have you done? Well, I smell something. He said, well, I went ahead and offered the sacrifice. He said, listen, you don't do that. You've disobeyed God. And you shouldn't have done that because you, that's not your place to do that. <clears throat> I thought I was doing the right thing. Yeah, you might have thought you were doing the right thing, but you weren't doing it. A couple chapters later, in 1 Samuel 15, they're in battle, and uh, Saul, you know, he's this great king now, and, he, and God told him through Samuel, hey, when you go fight the Amalekites, I want you to destroy every single living thing. Now, that's hard for us to understand on this side of, the, of history, but that's what, that's what God wanted from them. And so that's what God wanted. That's what you do. But Samuel said, no, let's keep, some of these, uh, let's keep some of the sheep and some of the best of the livestock to offer as a sacrifice to our God. And who knows, we might be able to use them. And let's keep the king Agag alive so we might question him. And so when Samuel shows up, Saul, a little bit nervously, says, hey, Samuel, good, you know, I'm glad you came. We did everything God wanted us to do. And Samuel said, then why do I hear sheep? Why do I hear cattle? And uh, Samuel threw his uh, soldiers under the chariot, you know, and says, hey, it was the soldiers who kept them. No, it was Samuel and Sa uh, Saul, and Samuel, uh, Saul threw them under the chariot, and Samuel told Saul, he said, uh, listen, he said, God wants you to obey. You just need to obey. When God says to obey, you need to obey. To obey is better than sacrifice. And then he told something to Saul that matters to our story today. 
He said, Saul, you could have had somebody on the throne for the rest of your generations. But because you have disobeyed God today, God is taking the throne from you, and he's going to give it to another. He's going to give it to a man after God's own heart. That's why David is known as a man after God's own heart. We know he wasn't perfect, but when he sinned, he came clean. And so at that moment, God told Samuel, he said, Samuel, we're going to go anoint a new king. <clears throat> Saul's going to be the king for a little while longer, but we're going to anoint a new king today. So about that time, Samuel puts on his traveling robe and traveling sandals and his staff, and he heads a, packs a lunch, and he goes toward Bethlehem. He goes to, to the house of Jesse. Jesse is a noble man. He's got eight sons. Man, if, a, if, if, a, if an Old Testament character was, was blessed, you could look at his family. And if he had sons, man, he was just rolling in it because all these sons were, were workers, man. They were, they were just going to add to the, to, the, to the property value and everything. And so uh, Samuel knocks on the door, and you might remember this scene. Uh, the door is open, and Jesse's like, hey, Samuel, I, I know you. I've seen you on TV. You know, you're the prophet. You're the, you're the guy. And he, what are you doing in my house? And Samuel says, listen, Jesse, you won. You, won. You, you got the winning ticket here. God is going to choose a new king from your house. And I'm sure Samuel's like, hey, tell the boys to get dressed up and come on in here. And the Bible says that the oldest one showed up first. But I want to tell you something before we read that scripture. Here's what Samuel did. I don't know why Samuel did this because Samuel knew better. But Samuel put God in a medium-sized box. Because you remember what happened, don't you? Eliab, the first one, came up in front of Samuel, and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. You got a guy, you know, who's all decked out. He's the oldest. He's the firstborn. And in Old Testament times, you know, the firstborn, that's kind of the important guy there. He's going to get the inheritance. He's going to be the one to lead the family. He's going to be the one upon whom the mantle of leadership and uh, property and wealth all falls uh, unless he, he is a she. <laughs> and if he is a she, then it goes to the first he. And so uh, he didn't have any she's in the family. We don't know anything about mama. I'm sure she was there. But that's kind of interesting. You know, what kind of a woman could raise eight boys. Well, this is a strong woman, isn't it? And so Eliab is the best looking, no doubt, or, or at least good looking. And he stands there and, and God says to Samuel, listen, don't put me in a box. Don't put my anointing in a box. Listen, he said to Samuel, he said, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. And this, listen to what he says next. This is what we use a lot. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks where? At the heart. Now, that verse has been used to defend a lot of things. You know, I remember when I was first learning to be a preacher, or, you know, I was in Bible college, and, and uh, you know, I was coming out to be a preacher at my first church, or even in my early days here, there was a certain way preachers had to dress, and, uh, uh, you know, there was a certain way that preachers had to act, and all these things, and, and um, you know, and so, you know, I wish, that, I wish this verse had been real, more real to me earlier, because I hate wearing ties, I really do. Anybody share that affinity or disaffinity with me? You don't have to wear a tie here. Now, you can wear a tie if you're comfortable wearing a tie. I think really all a tie is handy for is if you spill something, you know, you can wipe your mouth with it or something. <laughs> now, listen, honestly, I don't have anything against ties. Uh, I, you know, some of you look great in ties. If you have a tie on now, I'm not looking at you. I think you look great with a tie on. But you know how ties got started? My understanding is that in the, in the, the, the ancient caravan, they used to wrap, the, the, the Arabians maybe, used to wrap the scarf around their neck, and that's the way they used it. They used it to wipe their mouth. That's why you have those paisley-looking ties. You know, you can hide anything on a paisley tie. <laughs> uh, you can spill the meatloaf, the cake, the pie, everything on there, and it just blends right in. Really. Listen, do you have to look a certain way to be God's anointed? Do you, do you have to be a certain height? Do you have to make a certain grade? 
Do you have to weigh a certain amount? What, what is it? It's your heart. It's your heart. And, and so if we were looking at David's life, we would, uh, we would say the first chapter is God's anointing. God can use anybody. He can use anybody. That's an incredible statement because there are a lot of people who, who, uh, who, who've kind of been written off by society. You can look at some of the brilliant people in, our, in, the, in the history of this country who were told they were dunces or that they, were, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't, wouldn't make it. God can use anybody. And so uh, these seven boys line up in front of uh, Samuel, and, man, they got their three-piece suits on, their wingtips, and their hair slicked back there, you know, and, and uh, they're standing tall. And, and the, the guy next in line, you know, when God says, uh, when Samuel says, to, you know, God had told Samuel, and Samuel says, you know, you're not the one. The next guy said, yes. And, uh, you know, it's got to be me. And uh, it's kind of like, like a groomsman, you know, the groom. You know, they all stand right here. And uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's like American Idol is really what it is, <clears throat> you know, kind of. They're all, and the next one is like, dang on it, and the next one. And then they get to number seven, and, and God said, I don't, I haven't chosen any of these guys. And Samuel, he's like, well, I know God told me to come to your house. I know that you're, you're the one, you're, are you the Jesse, are you Jesse, Jesse, you know, whatever your name is? Uh, uh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> you, yeah, well, I'm, well, you got anybody else? kind of awkward here these boys that got all dressed up or nothing he said well yeah he said i got another son now you wouldn't know this unless you studied a little bit more into the word meanings but what jesse said next was kind of a you know it's kind of how he viewed his son he said uh i got the little brother i got the runt that's really the word for runt how do you know what a runt is how many of you were the runt anybody were the runt <laughs> yeah you know, it's kind of like when, uh, when uh, Willie and Jace duct tape Jep to the pole. Anybody see that episode? He's the little brother. That's what he gets. And uh, we got the run out there in the field, but he's the shepherd. And, uh, you know, the shepherd job. We're living on this side of the cross and on this side of the biblical history uh, to some degree. And so we're looking back and kind of glamorizing the shepherd. He's kind of a big deal. And when you were, uh, when you were a kid, you played the shepherd, you know, you put the bathrobe on. And, uh, or maybe you just got an old robe some, some lady in the church made you had to wear, and it was musty because it had been in there for 100 years. And you wrapped something around your head. But, but, you know, you knew you moved up when they said, this year you're going to be a wise man. Then you did get the bathrobe and the aluminum foil crown. So the shepherd, really, that job was a mundane job. Mundane, long, hot. Having been in Iraq, in Afghanistan, you know, mostly Iraq, more than Afghanistan, where you see these shepherds and there's these little boys, sometimes they're girls, and they're just, it's, it's 130 degrees, and they're out there either riding a donkey or, or maybe they're mostly walking, and they've got these maybe 15 or 20 scraggly-looking sheep in front of them or maybe behind them, and they're just taking them somewhere to get a little bit more grass, and there's not a lot of good grass over there either. That's why they look like they do. And uh, it's, it's a job for anybody who can't do anything else. And uh, it's, it's not something that you would aspire to. They don't offer a degree in shepherding at Marshall or WVU or State. It, it, you know, you just, anybody can do it. So that's what David was doing. And when he stood in front of Samuel, God whispered to him, and Samuel's heart started beating fast, and God said, he's the one, he's the one. Samuel's like, what, are you sure, God? You know, all these guys are in three-piece suits with wingtips, and this kid comes in here, and he smells like sheep. <laughs> he's the one. This guy stinks. The Bible says he was handsome. He was handsome, he was ruddy. I think that's a word that kind of refers to maybe he had reddish hair. There's hope for red-haired people. I don't know. I'm not really sure, but it had something to do with his complexion. And so on that day in his daddy's living room, the prophet poured some oil over his head and said, You, my son, are the next king of Israel. And I'm sure David is like, oh, Really? Does this mean I don't have to be a shepherd anymore? His brothers are like, what? Really? Who's going to do the shepherd work now? And, and Samuel says, no, you just keep, continue to do what you're doing. 
I'll let you know when we're ready for you. And so David was anointed king, but he went right back out into the field to be the shepherd. But you know what? God can use anybody. <clears throat> you look at some of the people in our, in our world today. Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson, kind of, he was the fall guy for Richard Nixon. Charles Colson. He was a dirty, rotten scoundrel at one time. You know, he was, he, he, he was uh, in Washington. He was protecting a president. He would lie, cheat, steal, do whatever he had to do to save face. And he took the fall for Nixon and all the Watergate stuff. And he went to prison. And in prison, he came to know the Lord. He was converted to Christ. And uh, when he got out of prison, instead of just saying, Woo, I'm free, let me just go live my life the way I want to, he said, no, this has made a difference in my life. And he became one of the, one of the world leaders his ministry to prison inmates, his advance of the gospel, his intelligence, his apologetic writing. He was one of the, he's one of the greatest Christian thinkers of our age. He's gone now. But uh, I want you to listen to what Carl Henry, theologian Carl Henry, said when he was thinking about Chuck Colson and the next generation of Christian leaders. He said this, Carl Henry, he said, many of the next generation of Christian leaders are probably still pagans. Who knew that Saul of Tarsus would be the great apostle to the Gentiles? Who knew that God would raise up C.S. Lewis or Chuck Colson, who were once unbelievers? The next Jonathan Edwards might be the man driving in front of you with a Darwin fish on his bumper. And the next Charles Wesley might be a profane, womanizing hip-hop artist right now. And the next Billy Graham might be passed out drunk in a fraternity house at the moment. And the next Mother Teresa might be managing an abortion clinic. You see, when... Some people see a shepherd boy, others see a king. And so there are people in our lives that we've written off. We're saying, you know, I don't want to be around you. And some of you are trying to live the Christian life at college or wherever you are. And, and it, it, maybe it's your workplace and Monday morning rolls around and your workmate rolls in and he's been on a drunk for the last three days and you're like, gosh, I don't want to be around him. You know, I can still smell it on him and, and he's such a, 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 you know, doofus and I just don't want to be around him. But God may say, you know what, I wish you'd talk to him. I wish you'd reach out to him because he's going to be the next Christian leader He's going to be a pastor. He's going to be a, a, a Christian businessman who advances the kingdom where he works. He, he's, if you just bridge a gap with him and reach out to him. A lot of teachers have told kids, hey, you're not going to, you're not going to mount anything. It reminds me of Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel is a late night comedian, I think, and he was at the White House Correspondent Dinner. And um, he was receiving this big award. And uh, he was giving this speech after this award, and he, he said, and lastly, I'd like to thank Mr. Mills, my 10th grade history teacher, who told me I wouldn't amount to anything. He said, Mr. Mills, I'm about to high-five the President of the United States. And he did. Who is it that you're counting out? Maybe yourself. Maybe you're saying, you know what, God can't use me. I'm too old. I'm too broken. I'm too insignificant. I've messed up too much, gone through too many marriages, I've, I've mismanaged money, I've done this, I've done that, I'm this, I'm that, you know, they tell me I'm this, I'm that. Listen, get God out of that box. Get, don't put God's anointing in a box because he can use anybody. He can use anybody. And so, uh, so David goes back to being a shepherd. He's just a shepherd. He's like, what? Was this for real? Are they just joking me, pulling my leg? I was just anointed king, and they're still treating me like the little brother. Now, at that time, he was about 14. Fast forward three or four or five years, he's about 18 or 19, because we know he's not old enough to fight in the army. Because guess where the seven brothers are? They're fighting in the army, and they're all fighting against this, this Philistine army. And so dad says, hey, go get David. I need to send some care packages to his brothers. And David comes and he says, hey, take these care packages up to your brothers. They're fighting on the front line up there in the valley. And they need some food and some clothing, a change of underwear, whatever. You know, they forgot. And I just want you to take it to them. And David said, oh, okay. So he hauls his stuff up there. And when he gets there, he sees what he never wanted to see. Now, you've got to understand, David, while he was a shepherd, he, he only did a few things. He watched sheep. He was a musician, so he was a singer of songs. That's why we have the book of Psalms. He wrote most of those, and they were put to music. And, and he, he did another thing. He picked up some, 
some rocks and he picked up a slingshot or a sling and he became a slinger of rocks. And while he was sitting there and there's long hours of these dumb sheep just standing around looking at him like, where are you going to feed me or what am I going to eat? He began to sling rocks at things and, you know, he began to practice. And then before you know it, wild animals would come in and he got to put that to use and he killed a lot of wild animals. So he was a, a shepherd of sheep. He was a singer of songs and a slinger of rocks. And so when he walks up that day, the army, they're all milling about. Nobody's really, there's no activity up there. Even his brothers see him and say, David, what are you doing here? Dad sent the care packages. He says, hey, and then he hears it, and he hears what he never wants to hear. This is a big, dumb guy on the other end of the field, and he's big. He's like nine feet tall. And he is yelling over at the Israelite army. <clears throat> Remember the story? It's one of the greatest stories in the Bible. It's David and Goliath. And David says, he, listen to what he says. <clears throat> uh, and if we, if we titled this chapter, by the way, it's God's opportunities. He can do anything. He can do anything. Because listen to what David says. He said, uh, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is he anyway that he should defy the armies of the living God? In other words, David said, look, why is he allowed to do this? Do you guys have God in a box that he can, be, he can be ridiculed like that? And he can be taunted like that? Are you afraid of him? That's what happens, by the way, when you put God in a box, even a medium-sized box. He doesn't have time for you. You got a big problem on Monday. You already put him up for the week. He, he can't fix your problem because he's too small. And so David didn't put God in a box. Samuel did, but David, he didn't put him in a box. David goes up there and said, look, you're talking about my God. And I got news for you. My God is bigger than you are. You see, it wasn't David versus Goliath. We got it all wrong. Not in David's eyes. It was who? It was God versus Goliath. Can you look at your problems that way? It's not your problem. Hey, God, this is our problem. What are you going to do about it? God said, I'm going to use you to fix this problem. Okay, just so you're there. So you're ahead of me. You see, that's the way God works. He can do anything he wants to do. So David, he reaches down and he, well, no, first he, he goes to his brothers and he says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of this guy for you. And they're like, David, go home, you little punk. Shut up. Go home, you're going to embarrass us. Have you ever been embarrassed by your little brother? Yeah. And uh, so go home. And so David says, nope, I, I, I'm not going to stand for this. You guys might, but I'm not going to stand for this. That's why God, he was a man after God's own heart. So they said, all right, let's go up here to Saul. Maybe another soldier said, I'm going to take you up to Saul. And Saul's in there, sweat rolling off his head. He's wringing his hands. He's like, what are we going to do? Because it's, it's a challenge. It's a mano y mano. It's man against man. And so that's, that was the deal. The Philistines said, look, we don't have to fight as armies here. Let's just fight one-on-one. -on -one. You send your best guy out here, and we'll fight. And whoever wins, that's whose army wins. But not one guy, there was not one army ranger, not one special forces guy, not one Navy SEAL, not one tough mountain West Virginia boy who would step up and say, I'll do it, I'll do it. They were all cowering in fear because their God was in a box. And David said, I'll do it, Saul. And Saul said, look. You can't do this. You're just a little runt. Listen to what he said. David said, look, Saul, don't lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. In other words, don't sweat it. I got it. Saul said, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. And he has been a warrior from his youth. In other words, this guy was born. He was born 20 pounds, man. He was fighting coming out. David, he wouldn't listen to that. So you remember what they tried to do? They tried to put Saul's armor on David. You ever seen a little peewee midget football player? You know, he's just a little guy, and he's got the shoulder pads and the helmet, and the helmet's, you know, he's bouncing around his head. He's going around backwards, and his, these shoulder pads are out to here, the smallest ones they got, and this little kid's running down on the field. That's kind of what David looked like in Saul's armor. So he said, look, I can't do this. Took that armor off, and he went out in the field, and he, he, he said, I'm going to face him. And Saul didn't really have a, a, he didn't have an option. He didn't have anybody else stepping up, so he, he said, all right, going out there, maybe that'll buy us a little time at least as he gobbles you up. <laughs> and uh, so David goes out there and he picks up five stones. You ever wonder why he picked up five stones? I used to wonder, why five? Did he think he was going to miss? 
Did he think maybe it was going to take two or three to get through that big fat skull of Goliath? No. Here's what, as we study, if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 18 to 22, it kind of indicates that Goliath had perhaps four brothers. So David's like, I got one for you, and I got one for your other four too. You come on up and take yours. He was ready for all five of them. That's kind of what I think is going on here. So he was ready for not just Goliath, but the next four. But I doubt they stuck around, uh, stuck around very long. Because uh, here's what happened. <clears throat> the, uh, the Philistine Goliath said, uh, he said, come here, little runt. He said, I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Before that, he said, uh, he said am I a dog? that you would come to me with sticks. He's kind of laughing at David. Am I a dog? Isn't it just like God to continue to stack the odds against himself so that when it's all said and done, nobody can say, look at what I've done, but we have to say, look at what God did. How did you keep your marriage together? How did you endure that grief? How did you, how did you continue to, to go forward when everything was against you? By the grace of God. Just by the grace of God. Wow, what kind of a God do you serve? Oh, he's a big God. He's a big God. And so, uh, uh, am I a dog? Well, he might have been a dog, or maybe the son of a dog, <laughs> uh, or a female dog or something. But David said to the Philistine, he said, Look, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day, this is little David talking to the Goliath. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. I like that line right there. And just to top things off, man, I'm going to cut your head off. I'll be holding your head here in just a few minutes. And uh, this very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear, that the Lord saves because the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hands today. Pretty strong words, don't you think? Confident. And so David slung that rock. He was a slinger of rocks. Maybe he was whistling a tune as he did it. Uh, you know, what's a good tune for David to be singing uh, something? I'm sure you can think of one. But sing that song. He slings that rock. And the giant falls. And he cuts off his head. And I think, I think this happened so quickly uh, you know, all of a sudden, the, the giant was taunting, and then all of a sudden, he's got this rock halfway through his skull, and he falls down. I don't think it killed him. It knocked him out. And I think for a moment, suspended in time, everybody froze. It's kind of like when Craig Whiteside and I went to the Bristol, my first Bristol race, and uh, Dale Earnhardt bumped uh, Terry Labonte in the last corner to win the race. Remember that? And the entire stadium, 120,000 people were like, did he just do that? Can he win? Can we say he won? Because everybody wanted him to win. And I told Craig, I said, let's get the heck out of here, man, and beat this crowd. And we ran down the steps. I think for a moment, <clears throat> the Israelite army were like, did he just do that? And I think the Philistine army were like, did he just fall? And I think they froze in time. If, if I, I'd like to have a snapshot of that moment of both. You know, if God has a Facebook page, if he could put that on there, you know, and their mouths are dropped open, and it's like, did that just happen? And, and just a split, this all happened in a split second. You know how you can freeze those moments? And he ran, and he cut that head off, and before you know it, the Israelite was like a swarm of bees on those guys, and they were slashing and cutting, and God can do anything, and he can use anybody to do it. Isn't that an amazing story? Now, <clears throat> if we want to have a closing chapter in David's life, it would be God's timing. Because I think where most of us kind of struggle with God, because he's in a box, is that, you know, um, is we struggle with God doing things in our time. And so, you know, we're Americans, right? If we want something, we want it right now. It's like that Russian comedian that came to America for the first time, went to a grocery store, and he was talking about it, and he said, you know, I was going through the grocery store, and he said, I saw this, I saw this, this stuff. It, was, uh, it said milk powder, and he said, you just add water, and you have milk. He said, wow, crazy, no cow, nothing. 
He said, I went on down, and he said, I saw this soup powder. You add water, and boom, you got soup. He said, a oh, lots of products. Like I said, I went to the next aisle, and he says, I saw this product that said baby powder. He said, wow, what a country. What a country. You just add water, and boom, you got a baby. Wouldn't that be great if you could do that? Use a lot of baby powder. Listen, do you know how long it was before David actually put the crown on? 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 4, says that David was 30 years old when he became the king of Israel, and he reigned for 40 years. So let's do the math here. If he was Sophie's age, uh, oh, 14, 15 years old, and then he was 30 when he finally became king, this was no joke. 15 years he had to wait. Well, at least that wasn't as long as Abraham had to wait to have that baby. 25 years. You see, God can use anybody to do anything at any time. I don't know what you're waiting on God to do. David wrote these words, I think, and many others like them. In Psalm 27, he said, wait for the Lord. That's hard, isn't it? hard to wait. I just want to get my life going. I want this or I want that. But see, what you don't understand is that just like God was preparing David as a singer of songs and a slinger of rocks, God's preparing you right now for something. And it might be, your moment might come at the end of your life. But if that's God's purpose for you, then let it be. In the meantime, wait for God, but continue to, to do what he's gifted you to do. But there's going to come a moment in your life, your defining moment, when you're going to know it and you're going to toe the line and you're going to say, man, I, I, I was made for this. I was created for this. And it's been a long time coming. Listen, for some of you, it might be, it, it might be a moment. And I, I hope maybe for me, it might be a moment you're in a nursing home or on a, in a rocking chair on a front porch and you look over at your wife and you say, whew, 75 years or uh, 50 years. And uh, people are celebrating with you your 50th wedding anniversary. Or your, we got a couple in our family, 75 years, a couple in our church, 75 years, Paris and Mildred Stevens. And they're all celebrating. And you look over at your wife, and she don't look like she used to. <laughs> Neither do you. She don't move like it. It's all that changed. But you look over and you say, you know what? This is what we were made for right here. They look at us and say, my parents were faithful to one another. And I can remember when they could have thrown the, towel, thrown the towel in. They stayed together. And that was what you were made for. And that inspires everybody around you. And I could, I could make a lot, big list there. Listen, if your God says, hey, um, you come once a week and spend some time with me and worship me, it's okay. I, it's not a big deal. And your God is too small. If your God always agrees with you, if he always agrees with you, your God's too small. If your God says, uh, <clears throat> hey, um, you know, you got those bad habits you've been, uh, you've been doing in secret, and uh, hey, don't worry about them. It's no big deal. Your God's too small. If your God says, hey, you, you know, your marriage, it's, uh, it's almost over anyway. You might as well throw in the towel on it and move on. Listen, your God is too small. If your God says, hey, you know, everybody else your age is doing this, eh, you might as well do it too. It's okay. I still love you. Your God is too small. How big is your God? Is he a God you can put your hands around? You got it figured out? He comes through when you want him to come through? And if he doesn't, you're going to run on him? Or is your God so big that you realize he can use you and he can use you to do anything and he can use you to do anything at any time? So be ready. Let's pray. And then we're going to, after we pray, we're going to sing a song as a response song. And it's just kind of about the bigness of God. And if you leave here with any Thing planted in your soul and your heart leave here with the idea and no matter what comes in my life my God is bigger let's pray God thank you for your bigness thank you God that you don't do boxes that you smash boxes that you don't fit in boxes 
And God, I pray for the folks sitting in this room right now that whatever they're facing in their life, whatever they're going through, God, that they wouldn't put you in a box, they wouldn't limit you and your ability, that you, you could do anything through them and help them to realize it, God. And who knows what seeds are going to be planted and what's going to happen, God. Give us the courage to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're here today and you've, you want to accept Christ as your Savior, be baptized this morning, maybe you want to put roots down, uh, come, come join us today. Stand up with us as we sing this song.